Hey everybody, it is Winnie coming to you from the Think Tank. So I haven't been posting as much of late. My health still isn't great. I'm going to see some other specialists to see if we can't uh, try to find some of the underlying causes still. Um, though I am doing significantly better than I have been. Um, but what I want to try to do over the next couple of weeks is I had started a series where I was focusing on each one of the nations and kind of like a basic overview for people who never played this sort of game, never played a major World War II game, and really don't even necessarily know that a lot about World War II. Um, you know, so not, if you go to play a game like this, yeah, you can read the victory objectives and, and all that, but you know, that's, it, that is, there's a difference there. If you know a lot about the war, then you can come into a game like this and hit the ground running. If you don't know a lot about the war, some of this may be very confusing about how to go about getting from point A to point B, uh, not just because of the rules, because some of the concepts. So I kind of want to pick up with that. I would like to finish that series. I want to uh, revisit the tech series. I want to start going into some of the expansions. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to do a KMT slash CCP video. And then I'm going to go talk about the China at War expansion in a separate video, which I think is a good expansion. So I, I, I would actually like to play that one at some point in a future game. So we're going to start off with the KMT. Um, so the Nationalists start at six bucks. Um, in 1936, and I'm only going to focus on the 36 scenario. I don't play the 39 scenario. I don't really have any interest in it. Um, so their overview, all, their home country is all starting KMT, CCP, Warlord zones, including Formosa, Hong Kong, Reihe, Northwest, and East Manchuria. So basically everything up that would be in uh, Manchukuo, I don't know if I'm pronouncing that right, minus Korea. Um... And in the 36th scenario, they start at war with the CCP, who's going to obviously start right there. Um, let's look at their victory objectives. Uh, expel foreign influence. Score one victory objective if at the end of a game there are no non-Chinese land units in continental China. Uh, now, it does define continental China, all starting KMT, CCP, and warlord land zones, excluding Hanin. So even though Hanin has a uh, narrow crossing right here, uh, that's not considered part of continental China. Um, and then the next one kind of works into that, uh, you know, goes into that a little bit too. We're score one victory objective at a game came T has possession of any two of the following land zones. Reihe, Formosa, Northern, Western, or Ethan, Eastern, Manchuria. So um, Formosa, even though it's considered home country, um, it is part of a separate, you know, you, you kind of have two different, uh, you know, the, the, the taking back of the home country kind of... Uh, is in two separate victory conditions, where there's the main body of the home country, and then there's the stuff Japan took. And so trying to get that back. Um, I don't know how they're going to get Formosa, Formosa back. I mean, that would be a heck of a game if they could. Uh, but but yeah, that'd be, you know, awesome if they could. Uh, let's see. And then the last one is defeat the communists. Score one victory objective if at end of game there are no CCP units in Chinese home country. Um, that's not as hard to do as it may sound. Um... Now, a lot of it depends about how, so what CCP does, whether they stick their neck out there on how their influence roles go. And quite frankly, I, you know, the last game I played, Japan took care of CCP for me. Um, so yeah, yay for, yay for that. Um, and I mean, at, we were actually, CC, KMT was actually defending uh, Senshi with the CCP at the same time. And Japan was still able to get in there and wipe, uh, wipe out the whole group and, and take that territory. So that took care of the communists, uh, you know, basically for the rest of the game. Um, now, they also have a, a limited build table. Um, they can only build infantry, militia, <clears throat> excuse me, infantry, militia, cavalry, mountain infantry. Now, they can build artillery and anti-aircraft, anti-aircraft artillery, but KMT is limited to doing that only if the Burma Road is open. Um, that now that's them building it. They can still take lend lease of other units that they you know uh, like artillery and, and other stuff like that and tanks and aircraft. But they themselves can't spend their. They can only spend their money for infantry, militia, cavalry, and mountain infantry. Um, then their let's look at their surrender. KMT surrenders when it has no land units left on the map and possesses no land zones. Um, so. Yeah, no units and no land zone. So if they still have a, a single land zone, maybe in the back country somewhere, they're not out of the game. Um, you know, in theory, you know, an, uh, one of the allies could come in and start liberating some territory and they could kind of bounce back. Um, now, 
one important thing about both, now this applies to both the CCP and the KMT, and this is their evolution to a major power. And I have actually seen this happen in a game with the CCP, but it basically works pretty much the same. Until evolved, the KMT can only build units from its own build table and move and attack within Chinese home country. Yeah, pretty normal. KMT evolves immediately once its land zone IPP values add up to 13 IPP, excluding bonus income. After evolving to a major power, it can build facilities, research technology, and can move and attack outside Chinese home country. After acquiring a factory, it may subsequently build anything on the U.S. build chart. An evolved KMT gains a strategic naval move of one. Now, I will say, just because I think me and my group agreed with this, even though it says anything on the U.S. build chart, I don't think they should be able to build uh, Marines. Uh, well, they can build standard Marines, but they can't, u- they can't build the U.S. Marine Corps units. Even though that is technically on their build chart, I really don't think it makes any sense for China to be able to build them. And they probably wouldn't want to anyway, to be perfectly honest. But... That's just one of those house things that me, you know, uh, me and, and I know my group has kind of uh, agreed on. Um, so, yeah. Uh, it Now, one thing I will say about this evolution of major power, and I'll, I'll throw this out there while I'm on this topic, is it doesn't say anything about lend leasing once they become a major power. Now, I assume they cannot lend lease once they're a minor, or if they're a minor power. But it doesn't say anything about lend leasing once they're a major power. Now, I will say this. Me and my group had a runaway game with the CCP, um, became a major power, took back almost all of China, um, was kind of tiptoeing around the coast with Japan, uh, and they started lend leasing some stuff back to Russia to help fight Germany. Um, while I don't think it was strictly allowed in the rules, because it doesn't say anything about them giving lend lease, none of us saw a problem with it. Uh, and it does kind of make sense. Uh, you know, before the, uh, you know, hostilities with Germany broke out, Russia was giving a lot of money to China or to CCP. CCP effectively won their civil war and they're like, oh, okay, well, Russia, now you're fighting for your life. Let's send some stuff back to you. And I don't think that's beyond a a reasonable historical thing that could have happened, um, even if the rules don't allow it. And and quite frankly, we didn't even realize whether it did or didn't. We just sort of assumed it did. But afterwards, I kind of looked at the rules and realize that it may not be uh, allowed. Um, but so be it. I don't think it was the end of the world that we did it. Um, <clears throat> so all that's pretty straightforward. Now, they do have a bunch of oddities. Now, wartime bonus income, they get plus one for the Burma Road when it's open. Um, they KMT can declare war on Chinese warlords, yes, and they can also declare war on any common turn, axis, or minor power once it has evolved to a major power, or if that nation has units in the Chinese home country. Now, that does specifically say excluding Hong Kong. KMT special abilities, decentralized military. KMT may place infantry class units and cavalry in any Chinese home country land zone if they possess the land zone since if they possessed the land zone since the start of the turn. No factory is required. A maximum of three units per land zone may be placed. Um, yeah, that's a, a pretty effective ability too. I mean, you know, they. I, I wish some of the other power major powers had it, but you know, obviously they don't. Barring you know, they got to pay a premium to build that colonial interest infantry. Um, now, the reason the Chinese could do this is because they didn't. They were an agricultural society. They they didn't have major points of industrial building. Um, you know, and I know other games have rated their infantry uh, uh, stats lower, but then they could do this. Well, this game doesn't do that, and that's fine. Um, but they do get, it, it is effectively a bonus for them because of that. Okay, now the warlords get a little tricky. Many regions in China are controlled by regional warlords at the start of the 1936 scenario. These semi-autonomous provinces are each marked with their own warlord roundel and individually covered for identification. And it lists them here. Um... An attack by a foreign country on an originally owned warlord, CCP, or KMT land zone is considered an attack on all of China and causes all warlords to align with KMT. Um, I will make a point. If that happens, that means no warlords align with CCP after that. And I, the last game I played, the Japanese player came in early to, in part to lock the CCP out of being able to align any other warlords uh, because they were worried about another runaway game. So that's one thing to consider as Japan. 
If a warlord is attacked by either Chinese faction, it and all its remaining land zones and units align to the other Chinese factions if unconquered by the end of the combat phase. Um, so, now there's really only two spots where that's an issue. Um, that's this warlord up here at the very north, which this warlord actually constitutes these three zones. And then Quang Tung down here in the south and Hanin are, uh, are one warlord as well. So, if KMT comes in here and takes this, this will flip to CCP. If they come in here and take Hopai, then these two will flip to the CCP. <clears throat> uh, Burma Road. If, uh, let's see, Bur the Burma Road opens July of 1938 or later if Japan is at war with the KMT. If not at war with Japan by 1938, it opens at the start of the next calendar turn, KMT and Japan are at war. The Burma Road can be used for lend lease, non combat movement, and strategic movement as if a railroad. If open, the KMT may purchase artillery and anti artillery, air, anti aircraft artillery. These must be placed in Yunnan. So, just to show, there's the Burma Road, and here's Yunnan. Uh, I like to call it Fortress Yunnan, and that, that'll become apparent in a moment why. Chinese truce. Even if the CCP and the KMT have signed a truce, either faction may still attack the other faction at any time. Uh, yeah, so uh, we, I played a game where we had a truce, but I had a chance to come in and take Shengtong from the Japanese because they had to leave it undefended to protect some other areas. And uh, so I effectively, and, and because I took it as a CCP, the KMT didn't get it back. And Japan was on the ropes in China anyway, so the CC or the KMT player, okay, well the truce is broken. I'm like, okay, sure. Um, so yeah, there's there's you know you can break it at any time at any point really. And then Hong Kong, Hong Kong is originally possessed by F FEC. Since KMT consider it Chinese home country, KMT does not have to return Hong Kong to FEC if capturing it from Japan or any other nation. So yeah. All of that is pretty straightforward for the KMT. Now, the real thing with KMT is this. They have six bucks a turn. Now, right off the bat, that equates to um, three uh, or two infantry a turn, or you can do a militia and a mountain a turn if you want to, you know, uh, go into move into some of the mountain territories, or you can do three militia a turn. The it's totally up to you what you do, obviously, depending on the circumstances. Now, the biggest question that that is going to come up is, does the KMT want to put a lot of effort into going after CCP right off the bat? Well, the answer is yes and no. Um, let's let's kind of well, let's let's kind of back up a little. So what does the CCP have to consider? It has to consider whether it's going to go after warlords, whether it's going to go after the CCP and when, assuming that the Japanese will come in, uh, when the Japanese will come in. Now, if they're expecting a really early Japanese attack, then obviously you probably don't want to worry about going after the warlords uh, because you're just going to lose units uh, going, you know, trying to take out those warlords. And I just realized that I, I inadvertently skipped over attack weakness, and this one is, is important. Upon attacking, each KMT regular infantry and cavalry that rolls a 10 or more retreats from the battle to the zone it attacked from. Units that are forced to retreat may not be taken as casualties. This does not count if a hit is made by first strike defenders and only units available for casualties and the only units available as casualties roll a 10 or higher. If the KMT has evolved to a major power, it no longer suffers this attack weakness. So if you roll a 10, 11, or a 12, that is actually a 25% chance for every one of your infantry and cavalry units to retreat. That's not insignificant. And, you know, I've seen huge swaths of infantry just retreat all of a sudden and, and completely turn the tide of battle where, you know, if they hadn't retreated, they probably could have done a good attrition rate to burn after turn after turn uh, and finally, you know, taken that territory from the Japanese. Um... But obviously, you know, if you roll bad, things go downhill, can go downhill real quick. Uh, even if you do attack at good with good odds, but then you have, 
you know, four or five infantry, you know, retreat on that very first round, suddenly there's this huge swing and then they score a couple free hits on you and you're like, oh God, I got to get out of here. And you just completely wasted, a, you know, a ton of units for no gain. Um, so if the CCP is expecting an early attack from Japan, they're probably better off just sitting tight and building units. And then the next, if that's the case, the next question is, is do you defend on the coast or do you move some of your units inland to save them to put pressure on Jap Japan later? Um, I personally prefer to try to conserve some units if I, if I think I'm going to, if I think I can get away with it. Um, however, there is a very strong argument for defending on the coast. Now, with all of Japan's firepower right on the coast, with its air force, with its shore bombardments, um, you know, with, with two or three turns, even, even only two or three turns of building up infantry and marines, that's usually enough to come in and take those coastal territories. Uh, you know, and if they wanted to do the whole, well, we're going to take this one, then we're going to take this one, maybe the same turn, and then that'll surround Nanking, and then we're going to come in and take Nanking. Um, they can probably do that. However... If, if you let them just walk in and do it, well, then they're, they're not really expending anything. Now, the trade-off to that is you've got units back here that they have to come into mountains to come after, but you're not really getting anything for those territories. But then he has to worry about garrisoning this place uh, later on in the game. Now, the, the trade-off to that is if you do defend on the coast and he brings in his Marines, let's say he brings in four Marines uh, into Shantung, um, in addition to whatever else is coming in, but then you, you actually manage to score two or three hits when you take out two or three Marines. Well, that can slow down his whole coastal all over the, you know, bouncing from one coastal region to the other. That can slow him down and really make him have to slow down a turn or two and, and rebuild those units. Now, not always, it just depends. And one of the problems with Nanking is it is a super easy to, uh, uh, surround. All you have to do is take Hunan and Shantung and then blockade the port. There's no uh, airfield there. And even then, it's not difficult for the Japanese to send in a bomber to, to damage the airfield and then properly surround the city. However, on the other hand, if you've got the city with, uh, you know, six, seven, eight militia in there, and then he's got a fight turn, you know, have to do multiple rounds of, of combat to take the city, well, then maybe you do grind him down and he can't immediately springboard into taking Kuang Tung or going up to Peking or Hopei or, or Suyan or whatever the case is. Um, so I think there is an argument for defending on the coast. Um, though I, I still personally prefer moving, moving what I... I don't completely abandon the coast because I want him to have to commit troops and not just have free reign to do whatever he wants. Um, but I do want to kind of have a force ready to, to start building up and, and form a counterattack. So you kind of got to look at it either way. Now, you know, one of those two, that's kind of how I look at it. Now, if you've got a Japanese player who you think is going to take his time in coming in and wait five, six, seven turns, um, you know, suddenly maybe you do want to go ahead and uh, uh, go after the CCP and finish him off and just take care of that problem. Uh, because then now you're starting to get that two bucks per turn. You can start building up, you know, extra units per turn and, and go forth from there. Uh, Quang Tung, you can theory could do the same thing. Um, you know, and, and those aren't, those are each worth two IPP per turn. Um, so it's, it's good. It, you know, it's good in that sense if you can do that. However, it's not, you know, in the long run, because you know Japan's probably going to come in, it's, it's, it, is that the best choice is to go after the warlords? Probably not, in my opinion, the way it's kind of worked out right now. And remember, even if you do come into Kuang Tung and you take it, this will immediately go CCP. And getting to this could be difficult because the CCP could automatically just start building a militia or two there. And okay, well, you're only bringing over one Marine. But, well, they can't even build Marines. You know, then what are you going to do to take Han in? Basically, he's, you're going to have to wait for the Japanese to come and take it. Um, and then same thing with Hopai, you know, because you have no naval lift to come up and take Peking right off the bat, it, let's say you do attack Hopai and come in and take that, well, then these two territories will immediately go to CCP, and that's three more bucks for them, and then all those units. So what are your other options? Yunnan? Well, I really don't think Yunnan is worth taking uh, as, as the KMT. Uh, you're better off waiting for the Japanese to attack and then letting Yunnan flip over. 
Uh, and then same thing with Sing Hai. Unless you have some plan to kind of uh, encircle Senshi, or you come up here, or you want to come up here and then take both these territories at the same time, and then after that follow up into here uh, and deny the CCP that that kind of you know free free money from back here uh, and time to rebuild it or, or reinforce it. You know, I don't know whether that's that's uh, you know your best bet. Um, you know, unfortunately, it's 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 kind of a damned if you do, damned if you don't with this KMT. Uh, and that's just kind of the nature of the beast. So, yeah, I don't have a good answer for that. Uh, you're going to have to kind of, you know, just free, look, take a look at the game and figure out how, how the, the pace is going to go. So I'm going to go ahead. I'm going to wrap up the video there and I'm going to do a CCP video and then I'll do a China at War video. Um, if you've got any questions or anything, you know, leave comments below and we'll go from there. Winter mute out.